1 Thessalonians, we're in chapter 4, and again reading verses 1 to 12. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that you, that as you received from us how you ought to live and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual morality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress or wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may live properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. You know, so we, we talked a little bit yesterday about Paul's call here to um, holiness and blamelessness and how one of the main priorities of that is to live lives that were free from sexual immorality, that we would flee from sexually immoral things and actions and all of that. And their society was so overwhelmed with that. But there was still a little bit more on this I want to I want to talk about before we move on, because I think it's important because Paul called us all. Uh, he's not just talking to a non-believer. He's talking into the church to avoid sexual immorality because it creeps in. Look at the church's history. We have seen a, in a generation, probably 20, 30 years ago, um, you had individuals who, if, if you found out someone was a priest or a pastor, there was an immediate respect for that position. Nowadays, there's an immediate distrust because of all of the sexual issues that we have had in the church. And this is not just a Catholic church issue, right? Sometimes we like to blame somebody else, but it's happened in countless denominations, countless churches. It's a human issue. We all need to flee from it, to avoid it. He confirms this need to avoid with three arguments that he gives. First, his first argument is the Lord will punish for all these sins, so don't do them. <laughs> I mean, pretty plain and simple, right? The Lord will punish for all these sins, so don't do them. You know, what he says is reminiscent of some other words. So if we go to Luke chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, it says by... Uh, what um, Jesus, right? Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Sin happens and sin creeps in, and we think we can hide it. We think we can keep it to ourselves, and then it gets too big, and then it gets out. <laughs> sin can't be hidden. Now, we think we can hide it from each other, but and we even think we can hide it from God, but it cannot be hiding, it, hidden. Even in the small, it creeps in, and God sees it, and so the Lord will punish for all the sins. So don't do them. Stay away from them. Good morning, Vicky. So not only that passage there in Luke 12, does Jesus speak about that with the, um, that everything we do will be brought into the light, even if we think it'll be in secret, right? And how many times have we seen that? Um, you know, we're in political times right now and things creep up during politics that, 
you know, supposedly they find out about somebody or, or, or just other ways sins creep in, you know, individuals having say affairs or having addictions to pornography or alcohol or whatever, it creeps in until it takes control until they begin to sin without thinking because their heart is turned towards sin versus being torn towards or turned towards God. Another passage that kind of speaks towards this idea that Paul's talking about is Exodus 14, 14. Because not only will God punish the sins, but sometimes there are sins of others towards us, and we try to take it in our own hands. We try to be the moral majority, right? We try to be the, the legal uh, parole that... Uh, um, judge and all of that jury and executioner and god says the lord will fight for you and you only have to be silent sometimes we get ourselves in trouble and sin creeps in when pride and arrogance and jealousy and all of that seeps in and when people say things about us that we don't like The Lord fights our battles. We just be still. You might be going through a difficulty. Maybe someone you love has an addiction and they're trying to hide it, but it's starting to come to light and you don't know what to do. Maybe this verse is for you. <laughs> the Lord will fight your battles. Just be still. Just trust him. Pray and trust him. The second argument that Paul gives to us is that God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Good morning, Pat. He did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Literally, to live a life of sanctification is the words. It's a process of growth from body and mind and spirit. You know, I, I like to say that he changes us inwardly so that we will be outwardly and corporately different. That's how God changes us. He changes us inwardly first so that we are made different outwardly and corporately, not in our strength, but in his. We were not called to be impure as believers. We were not called to be the same as the world around us. We were not called to be drawn into divisiveness. We were not called called to live a life of sexual immorality or alcoholism or impurities that so often plague the world around us, we were to be chosen children of God who were bought with a price living differently because of him, because of his grace, because of his holiness, not my strength, not my ability to get everything right. My ability to humbly admit, you know, that's something that we don't always do well in our culture, is it? To say, I'm sorry. To admit that I did something wrong. To be sorry for what I did and to seek God's forgiveness, right? And others. Good morning, Jen. You know, I think when Paul was talking about this, you know, that God did not call us to be impure, but to live holy lives, uh, you know, he was maybe um, still processing, because remember, Thessalonians is one of his first books, but in Romans 6, verse 1, he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might abound? I, I think that's kind of where his theology was heading towards, right? Good morning, Ray. You know, people, if we're not careful, even in our American culture, and, you know, you might be a part of a holiness church or a part of our church, and we believe in free will, but there is sometimes where things creep in that we begin to still believe in a hell insurance, that we're saved and that's good enough that we're saved and that will be okay. It's not that we work out our salvation at all. You do not earn your salvation. We've talked about that multiple times on here. 
but it's the attitude that God wants to continue to grow us in that work of sanctification. He wants to peel back the layers of our hearts to make us different inwardly, outwardly, and corporately. If after being saved, you are still a jerk to everyone you meet, then God still needs to work on you. <laughs> if you still are impatient with everyone you meet, impatience still happens. Let me tell you, I have seven kids, okay? But if you aren't getting losing your temper less because your focus is more on God, then you need to grow in sanctification. We all need to grow in sanctification, and it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Good morning, Michaela. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy. Um, but, uh, you know, that God is growing us in this work of sanctification, body, mind, spirit. So again, the arguments of Paul here is one, the Lord will punish all these sins, so don't do them. <laughs> Second, God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. We are called to live a life holy and devoted to him, standing out in the midst of chaos. Right? Being people of hope and peace in a hopeless, peaceless world. Good morning, Mom and Dad. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. And then the third argument that Paul has here, calling us to avoid sexual immorality and allowing that to creep in is, you know, one, the Lord will punish for all these sins, so don't do them. Two, God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life a life of sanctification, of growth. And third, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but rejects God, who gives us his Holy Spirit. We aren't rejecting man's instruction, man's wisdom. We're rejecting God. And that's even scarier, right? It's even scarier when we call the things of God not of God, right? It's very easy to look at people who don't agree with us and say, well, they can't be saved. Careful. Now, we'll know them by their fruits. You'll be able to see some of that, but just because maybe they believe differently. Maybe because their background and the traumas they've experienced causes them to be at a little bit different spot than you are spiritually. Careful. Favorite story or, 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 or uh, you know, capture in scripture is when the disciples came to Jesus in that haughty manner and said, Jesus, they over there, they're, they're casting out demons in your name. You need to go rebuke them. <laughs> And Jesus ends up kind of rebuking the disciples going, uh, no, I'm not going to. They're doing it in my name. You know, I want you to picture this. So, you know, the Old Testament it was the following. It was the history of Israel. You realize there was a lot of history going around elsewhere. And what's always blown my mind, because you see it as the people of Israel, and that's all we follow. But Abraham, in his journey, comes to this guy. And who does he come to? The priest, Melchizedek, who is a priest of the Most High God. Now, how can that be? Because Abraham and the Israelites are the only chosen people, and everybody else were pagans, right? Kind of like the English culture, we often in the early missionary days treated everybody else, whether that be Indians, whether that be Africans, whether that be, you know, because we went into them and they were savages, they were pagans, and they needed us to save them. And yet the early church was founded, the, 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 the early church had like five main churches, and half of them were in Africa. Church of, had the church of Antioch, but then you had the church of Alexandria, and, and yet in our arrogance, we don't believe that God works outside of us sometimes. Even when I can't see it, he's working. 
even when I can't feel it, he's working because the Holy Spirit proveniently is drawing all men and women unto him. But when we reject the instruction, the instruction of a church, of a pastor, or, or of Scripture, especially Scripture, when we reject that, we aren't rejecting what man has said. We are rejecting God. We are rejecting God. It's not when we ignore rules and are disobedient. It's when we ignore God. In his promptings and calling his promptings of not of God. That he rejects his people. He did it to the Israelites. He's done it to America at times. I think he is even yet today, right? Look at our culture. Look at Europe. It's a post-Christian nation now, and America more and more is growing to be a post-Christian nation, just like Europe. Used to be 70% of all the country of Europe was, and especially England, were in the churches, and now we have great mausoleums, beautiful cathedrals that are empty. They're museums to what once was. Drive up and down our county, you go into Ashtabula, and there are multiple churches that are shut down mausoleums to what once was. And you don't think that our culture has changed. Founded as a Christian nation or not, we aren't. Not anymore. I'm glad to debate that more, but just look at our culture. We have rejected the instruction of God. Whoa. <laughs> Woe is our society if we're not careful. We need to turn not, we need to turn individually first. <laughs> Fully devoted to God. Fleeing from immoralities in our lives because even in the church it is full of immorality. We look not much le more, not much different than the world. But how do you know the promptings of the Holy Spirit? You know, I get asked that sometimes, and there's three things that I want to share that as the Holy Spirit is instructing you, there ought to be three ways that you ought to know it. Because if not, we sometimes go, well, maybe that was just me. Maybe that was the bag of chips I ate. Maybe that was indigestion. I don't know if, the God's, if God's prompting me or not. And one is the scripture test. If what you are hearing is in line with the word of God, hey, that's a great test, right? But if God is speaking to you, you think speaking to you, or someone is saying, well, God told me about this for you, and it does not line up with the word of God, beware. In fact, flee from it. You know, the second test is the wisdom test. Because God is a God of order. The Holy Spirit is a God of order. Now, does he randomly call people out to do really crazy things like he did for, say, uh, uh, you know, Ezekiel, right? Naked and bound to prove a point to as, uh, as he was prophesying. Jeremiah, others, he called them um, to do very unusual things. Sorry, there was a fly buzzing by my face. We got like baby flies in here. Um, and, uh, you know, he calls us sometimes to do crazy things, but that's rare. You see, there's a wisdom test that God doesn't always come to you and say, oh, you need to sell everything you have, live in a cardboard box so that those that are homeless can have some money. Well, huh, I'd be double testing that, you know, and, and looking at scripture and getting confirmation. You know, God doesn't always call us to do crazy, whacked things without a sincere prompting that you would know without a shadow of a doubt that it's God. Because not, and this is not a pat, you know, on my back. I'm not saying this for that, but I was there. After 18 years with the same company, I was making over six figures and had a great job, a solid job. And God called me into the ministry and the first job we took was a 67% pay cut. God provided. 
God called us to adopt $67,000 in 16 months that we had to come up with. God provided every penny. He provides every single time. When he calls you to do something, that's the wisdom of knowing that he will see it through when it's definitely of him. And the third thing is you have the ministry test. The ministry test. So, you know, what I mean by that is this. So sometimes you get people that come up and said, well, the spirit told me to tell you this. And can I tell you, anytime somebody comes to me and says, God told me to tell you this, often it's something selfish for them. <laughs> it's something they want. And I want to be like, um, well, if it was really true, God would have told me to. Right? You know, and so be careful of the ministry test. The person who is saying this to you better have a life that lives it out. An example. So, about long story short, um, I, I've shared some on Sundays a little bit about a, a, a 12 hour cave trip that turned into 52. God kind of smacked me over the head. Um, my brother and I had given ourselves up for dead. And, and so I came out of there going, God, you saved me for a purpose. What is it? And I began, I, I had the uh, the church that we were at, um, it was a large church network with multiple different churches, and they asked us, um, they asked me to consider uh, becoming their executive pastor. And um, it started my journey back into ministry. I'd been a ministerial student one other time, and it, and it started my journey back into that. And so I was testing the waters, and if you will, like Gideon putting out the fleece, and went back to school, and all those type of things. But in the midst of this, as I'm still trying, before I'd even gone back to school, and I'm praying, asking God to show me, a lady in our church came up. Well, rewind. About six months prior, I'm in Mexico leading a mission trip. And this speaker comes to share a devotional that I'd never met. I knew everybody that worked for this organization because I'd been there like 15 times in just a matter of a few years and spent a lot of time with them, um, had been offered a job with them. You know, I mean, it, 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 I love this organization. And this lady came to speak that I had never met before that was a local pastor and um, had a great little spiel on Isaiah and the Eagles. And um, I still remember that. But uh, what I remember most was coming out of our room getting after I'd gotten ready for the day. And she's standing there with the interpreter and she looks at me and goes, God has you in a great ministry now, but it's not the one he has prepared you for. And she began to pray over me. Um, and she began to pray over me in tongues too, which was really kind of weird. Because <laughs> um, I, you know, I wasn't, I've been around tongues, but not ever had ever had anybody pray over me in tongues. And it was, whew, but it was, you could sense God. And, and but anyways, fast forward six months and a lady in our church, I'm still, I'm kind of thinking, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe I misunderstood, right? You know, and maybe the interpreter got it wrong. And I'm still kind of challenging this. And a lady in my church came up and goes, I don't do this. I never do this. I've never done this before, but God told me, Virginia goes, God told me to tell you he has you in a great ministry now, but it's not the one he prepared you for. <laughs> word for word, what this individual in Mexico had said six months prior. And then she went on to say, he's been telling me, I need to say that for about six months, but I, I, I just, I couldn't, I, I didn't, I was fighting him and yeah, I'm not going to fight him anymore. <laughs> God speaks sometimes through others, and when he does, you will see true ministry in their lives. Not just somebody who's not living it. Jeremiah and Ezekiel were able to speak into the nation of Israel because they lived it and breathed it. Their ministry was true. So Paul was calling us to sanctification. Sanctification consists not in a particular moral quality which has been attained, but in a particular relationship to God which has been given to you. You don't attain sanctification. You don't attain Christian perfection. It is what is given to you immediately at full surrender, but it's something that you continue to grow in as God gives it to you more and more with his grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. We are called to be sanctified. We are called to be holy, devoted, set apart. But the thing we must remember is it's not a physical separation from the world, but a distinctive life within the world. 
no longer oriented to the cultural values around us, but our hearts are oriented to the kingdom values within us. I posted something this morning, and you can go read it. Um, but it breaks my heart when I see individuals who, in the midst of politics, are so divisive. It's okay to be political. It's okay to attack agendas. But when we attack people, when we attack their character, be careful. Because God has told us throughout Scripture multiple things that, I mean, when I read it, 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 it concerns me to make sure that I'm following his instruction when he says, you know, you call somebody a fool and you've committed murder in your hearts. <whistles> Careful. Careful, church. It's okay to be political. It's okay to have our views. And it's okay to be passionate about those views. But do not allow that passion to turn into, you know, Paul calls sexual immorality here. But let's just go the passions of politics, the passions of how you vote, the passions of who you are voting for. Do not allow those to overtake you and hinder your witness and testimony because you damage others. Be careful. Anyone who says you fool will be liable of judgment. Ouch. Careful. We live in a time of deep political divisiveness. And the church is supposed to be a place of healing. A place where the Holy Spirit convicts and changes as we walk alongside those, each other, right? So Heavenly Father, I come before you and I just thank you that you use individuals like Paul to call us out. Lord, may we flee from immoralities, sexual immoralities. May we flee from anything that gets in the way of holiness. May we flee, not just turn from, not just seek to ignore, but purposely, all out, run, Jackie Joyner, curse her, turn around, jump those hurdles and run and flee with all of our might those things that keep us from being fully sanctified, devoted, set apart for your kingdom. Lord, anything in our witnesses that have kept people from you, may you point it out to us, convict us, God. May we be a people first who are seeking your holy, deep, life-changing conviction so that we are changed inwardly, therefore making a difference outwardly and corporately to everyone we meet. Holy Spirit, may your church be a place of healing where people are safe to come and discover you, to be discipled, and to go out to deploy. Deploy like a army, coordinated, in a joint effort to win our village, our county, and our nation back to you, God. Because that's what matters. Only you will change this nation. Only you can change the hearts of men. Start with us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, go in peace and uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.